Okay, so we're starting on time. And um, this is, let's see if I can do this, multiple cameras. So this is the, can you guess, in this hour? This is the badge clinic. You almost can read that. So what will we talk about in this hour? We'll talk about badges. These things here. Um, yeah, so we'll probably see what they can, what we can do with this year's badge because it's kind of a storage device. So we can use it for backup and some other interesting things. And because it's an office hour, there is no set agenda. So um, we'll probably jump around a bit from different topics. And I will watch the, keep my eyes on the general text and the office text channels in case, in case there are some questions. Okay, so I guess you can see that this year's badge looks a little different than last year's badge. They're about the same size. This year we have no LEDs and no power supply. There's no battery inside this year. In place of that, we have uh, a fine leather finish on the back with a plastic enclosure and a full color front overlay. And I'm just curious if audio is okay. <laughs> I don't know which channel to type to. There's all these channels. Okay, so um, I'm not going to make any changes unless somebody tells me. So one of the things you can see in this year's badge, even though it does have a front overlay that usually covers all of the parts with color plastic, this PET. So instead of seeing this, which is a PCB, you see this, which is a cover over a front overlay full color printed and in order to see these very small chips which we thought were would be interesting for all of the hardware hackers among us we put it we put in these transparent windows all right so let's take a look under the microscope at these transparent windows because i'm curious as well what this looks like so this is the raw PCB with a EEPROM integrated circuit on top there, soldered in. And when we take a look at the color, color, color overlay, okay, this is going to need focusing and less illumination. Yeah, you can't see too well, can you? I guess because the The light needs to be just right. Let's turn the light on again. No, okay, so my experiment didn't work that well, but um, these are the EEPROMs that are storing our data this time, this year. All right, so take a look at the channels and it seems that video and audio is okay. So we'll do a quick demonstration on how how we can write to these storage locations. All right, so that's the, that's with and without the, uh, the front overlay. And to write to this, the antenna is on the back. So we're going to need to align the antenna from the back with a reader device, which typically is a, is a smartphone. All right, in order to use the radio, to be able to use NFC, you have to turn the phone on and it has to be at some accessible screen for the users, right? So it can't be turned off. That's the first thing you need to do in order to use the badge over radio. The next thing you have to ensure that the NFC circuit is turned on. And that's right here. I can turn it off and you need to have that turned on. All right. So that those are the two things that you need. 
And after that, if you have nothing else happening aside from aside from uh, what do we have? We have Discord and the Chrome browser running on my phone. So something should happen if I have programmed something to this device and I align the antenna of the badge device to the phone. So I'm going to push the middle button there. And it brings up a web browser that's telling me that the data stored on this button, which I pushed, is a URL. And in case you're curious, this is what the URL is on all of the middle buttons. All right, so that's reading data off of the device, off of the badge. This year's electronic badge without really doing anything at all. This is right out of a box. <clears throat> what does the box look like? It looks like this. <laughs> I don't know if this is so interesting, but we'll do the unboxing. So you get a, so actually this is a wrong manual for this box, but you got this excellent manual by Andres. And in some part, I discovered this just on my own. Let's see if we can, in fact, on the printed manual, his name isn't on here. Oh, yes, it is. In fact, there it is. So it's not so um, so it's not so anonymous. I'm glad that he put his name on there. I thought he hadn't. So that comes in the box. Obviously, the different parts for a do-it-yourself model. You have to put it yourself together. You have to put do it yourself, put it together. So the parts that do come assembled are all of the very difficult things. That's these um, that's these dome switches, which if you if you get three of them and you lose one, then you don't have enough. If you don't lose all three, you still have to align them perfectly well over the over the circuits and then place tape on top without anything moving more than a half millimeter. So it's just kind of messy and uncomfortable. On top of everything else, we knew that we would have to pre-assemble some of the parts anyway, because these EEPROMs, which we have already seen under the microscope, they're only two by three millimeters wide, uh, and they're one half millimeter tall also. So they're very, very small. That's why we're pre-assembling at least some of the parts um, which come in the do-it-yourself kit. All right, so that's what comes in the box. And after you take that out, you have something like this. You put it together, put the leather on the back and the color overlay on the front, and then you can start programming and doing just the same thing that I showed before. I will do that just once more in case you, you didn't completely see it. This time, nothing on the front, okay? This time I'm going to show the action from the back. I'm going to align it over the, over the antenna. I'm gonna push down. Did you hear that? So that's how it sounds. And when I look at the front, well, it opened a, a web browser, okay? Now I've got a whole bunch of web browsers on here. Yeah, okay, so that's the reading right out of the box, okay? Because we did pre, um, we programmed some of these identifiers onto these devices. There are three three uh, EEPROMs, and on each EEPROM, you have a, a variety of different slots, depending on how much data, because they do have different capacities, these three EEPROMs. The first two are 512 bytes, and the last one is eight kilobytes. So depending on how much is there, you can do quite a lot of things. In fact, let's try using this program called NFC Tools. And I'm going to add several records. I'll try to do this very fast. Let's do Monero Village. Oops, Monero Village. Not spelling too well today. All right, we've got Monero Village. I'll put another URL on there for a pop quiz later on. Monero Devices. 
we'll put we'll put a piece of text we'll say this is um we'll just say defcon defcon 28 safe mode do you like that okay so we have some text what else should we put on there somebody give me an idea here take a look at all of these things i'll help you choose quite a lot of different types of information, isn't it? Each one of these um, conforms with the NDEF standard. So that's what goes on NFC da um, data storage. And every single one has a MIME type, which it's hiding from you because it's not a comfortable way to store information. It just tells you, okay, an address, and there's a MIME type associated with this. So let's just say Iceland. That's a place, isn't it? I think so. All right, so that's a place. We'll add another one. We'll add a file link. I don't know how, I've never done file link. I don't know how that works. Uh, so let's do application. <laughs> What's an easy one here? Email is really easy. We can do email info at Monero devices. And object, oh, okay, this, it seems that that should say subject, shouldn't it? Dumb subject. I don't know why it says object there. And here we'll just type hello world. So we're putting out entire email. The headers in the body, hello email, I guess. So we've got all of these different pieces of data. Do you folks see that? I mean, I could keep going, right? I could, what's more options? So I could keep going and we would have 20, 30, 50 pieces of data here and we can rearrange them. And what I wanted to show is that there are two URLs. So which one do you think will open a website? I mean, it's gonna open a website if I, if I write this to a, a to a, a village badge and then let's do that now. Let's let's write. So now it's saying approach NFC tag. Do you see that? This is all quite self-evident, I think. So I'll turn the phone over. I'll put align the badge onto the onto the phone's antenna on the back. This time I will use the I will use the star button. Shall I do that? All right, so it's saying approach NFC tag, and now I'm going to click on the star. All right, maybe you heard that, and it does say write complete. So what will happen now if I close this application? Do I wanna close this? Not really. Let's see what happens if I don't close it. So we're at the home screen, I suppose you call this. And I will, instead of clicking the second button, the moon there, I will click the star. So it does bring up a website, monerovillage.org. Oh, I think it's, I think, <laughs> I didn't use uh, encryption. I just wrote HTTP, I think. Is that what it's complaining about? No, Monero Village. Rerar, what's wrong with this? I don't understand the problem. Okay, so here is a URI. Uh, maybe it's because the www is not correct. The point is that the web browser opened. Certificate date is invalid. Okay, so it seems that we have some problem with our website. It doesn't matter too much. What's important is that this badge opened automatically a website that we had programmed in by ourselves. Um, onto this device, right? We can try this again, looking back at the list of pieces of data. What happens now if I rearrange this? If this URI replaces the first one, let's do that now, shall we? So I'm going to use the star again, but this is a different badge. So put that on the back there.
and I will click. Why isn't it working now? Could it be that another, oh, so this is not working, is it? Let's try this one again. Let's try this one. So this time it worked. Not sure what happened with that other badge. And the test is to see what happens now when, when I use that one button and it will bring up a website. Oh yeah, okay. So that's the correct website now that we looked at, that we got before, right? So that's kind of the, the workflow uh, of programming these and using them for for data, day data storage, All right? MoneroVillage.com. Is that what AJ is saying? <laughs> I thought it was .org. Have I been typing the wrong thing? All right, so AJ, I'm sorry, I have to do this. This is my screen and it looks quite good. Oh, but okay, that's German. I'm sorry about that. This, uh, no, you're right. So I've been typing org all, this, all these days and you're saying that I have to type com there? Then do I get a, a certificate? And it still says it's not se secure. All right, so this is not the, the right time to, to troubleshoot and debug the website. But um, we did, however, we did just have a demonstration of, um, of how to program and use these badges on a day-to-day -day basis. So I, I can show you um, our application or, or uh, homepage, I suppose you could call it, for um, this year's Village Badge. How do I do that? I have to go back to, back to this web browser. And because we were, we were spending most of our time on the hardware, the, the software interface or the website, in other words, it's some of the parts are working and others aren't. So this is bobmoneroDevices.com. This is with a good certificate. <laughs> okay, that's German, but it says a certificate is fine. So we have two different menus here, one at the top that can toggle left to right and one that goes up to down. And we've got some actions. I mean, it's a standard web application, right? We're not trying to make a whole operating system here. But the tradition, the typical things like the, like a, the about page, I guess this is good enough. It has all the information that you might expect. We have the welcome page there, which gives you an idea that you can use the badge on Android or iOS, because those two devices are smartphones with NFC circuits inside, and that NFC tools is the application that works. Um, there's a few other things that work as well, like the game. I'll just click on game there on the left. It takes a bit to load. So we teamed up, Monero um, Village teamed up with the Rogues Village and a few others as well. Uh, and they programmed a game which works with the which works with the badge. I haven't got ver that far myself, but you can see there's a few people who have made it to the end. And the one thing that I don't like, if you just left click on the play button, so there's a cross side scripting problem, which it's not a problem. It's how the website is intended to work, but they they it's called core C O R S. And what you have to do is click on the right, do a right button click, and then, I mean, you can choose any of these things. I'm just saying, if if I choose this, you won't see it. It's going to a different tab. 
All right, so what I'm going to do is copy the URL and then put it up here to show you what the game looks like. And this is a Rogue's Adventure game. There's a bunch of things to read about it here, but we will just kind of start playing. And although I haven't made it too far, according to our colleagues at the Rogue Village, it's about halfway through that you can use your, uh, your electronic badge with this game. So I'll just type some random thing here. And so I'm not going to do this too long, but I'd like to give you some idea of how it works. So you can go down the stairs. I think there's something to look at here. Look at fossils. <laughs> you get the idea, right? Um, so this is kind of fun. Now, how do I go backwards? Oh, I can indeed change the tabs. All right, so that's one of the things that is working. Uh, some other easy to introduce to implement things are working, like the gallery. I mean, this is not very valuable, but if you're interested in what the red one looks like, there it is. These are the different colors, and you've got the DIY, the do-it-yourself. That's why there's no plastic enclosures, and you've got the, the different parts that you put together yourself. This is the wonderful user manual that Andres created for us. It's really nice. Um, and this is kind of our experiment with the packaging, which we failed at last year. And this year we did pretty well, but we went overboard with that. So that's the gallery. We've got a file server where you can download um, the the glossy color user manual or that, well, it's not glossy electric. No. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I should take that off. Um, it's not printed on paper when you download it electronically. So there's no gloss or matte finish. Okay. But you can get copies of either one. Um, I'm not sure what happens if I click there, if it even works. Ah, you see, it does work. So there's Andres' design and all of the illustrations. Really wonderful work. So I'll go back, and you can you can tell that the file server is working. We've got status, which is kind of halfway accurate. It just says there this application is undergoing development, which is true. We've got a top 10 FAQ. Is how, so I explained already why the the playing of the game fails when you click on it. Which villages are participating? So none of this is all too exciting. What we actually really want, we start at the beginning here again. What we actually really want is here at the configure. No, I'm sorry, not the configure, but at the onboard. This is where it's going to get exciting because although, although it's not fully uh, implemented to actually write the uh, NDEF identifiers and pieces of data over radio. Um, so we want to implement those things here. And the way it will work, so you put your name here, any name at all, you could write, uh, you could change the, the gender and change the geography. You can write, you're one of, you're some dead person. <laughs> you could write, I am uh, Alfred Nobel. So Alfred Nobel is no longer with us. What I'm just saying is that you can create your, a pseudo name here, all right? It's a nickname. After you put that in, you check off the things that you're interested in. So I like IoT, I like rogues a lot. And um, while that's too many, maybe I want biohacking as well. I won't be able to get them all on there because I'm programming the very small EEPROM, so I need to take some off. You get the idea? So I'm just going to be interested in this one round. Rogues, Monero, and biohacking. We'll click on associate me, and these are, this is where it starts to not work. So even if I click on there, it's kind of, <laughs> these are not my choices. Yeah, you can see that this is um, still in prototype mode. So these are not my choices, but um, eventually we'll be able to write data or cancel, and it will start waiting for you to attach a badge or put a badge next to the antenna on the phone. If I want to do a factory reset, I can do that as well. And um, that's how this uh, association and um, onboarding um, functionality will work. Once you have your identifiers on the EEPROMs all lined up like you like, you might want red team on the third EEPROM, you might want biohacking on the 
second one and crypto privacy on Monero, you'll want maybe on the first one. Whatever it is, you, you line these up and you write them to your badge. You can then use the intervillage network. All right, and although this looks okay, it actually does look as it, like it works. So it says here under development, please stay tuned. So it's not working yet, okay? The, in the end, you can connect to the intervillage badge network by clicking on connect. You can do a ping just to test the, uh, the network connection. If you need to authenticate, because for example, some of the village rooms or channels or topics are uh, protected, maybe they would like to know who walks in through their doors, uh, then you can authenticate. And if you don't need to, then you just uh, skip that opcode or network code. You can turn on the bridge. I think the bridge will be activated by this command, the safe mode, which basically means we're going to do a proxy from the MQTT network, which is what we're connected to here, to the DEF CON um, uh, Discord. I mean, this is kind of not relevant because they're probably going to turn off the DEF, the DEF CON Discord uh, tomorrow. So there won't be much time to use it. But that's there just maybe for another day next year. So we can knock on one of the participating villages doors. We can knock on Monero's door. And if we don't get a response, we can knock again. And maybe on the third knock, we're automatically um, allowed to enter. There can be some logic like that. Once we're inside, we can tip using the using AJ's tipper bot, one, two, four units. And once we're inside, we can get information about our room. Maybe we're walking in the biohacking room for the first time. And we didn't realize that there is a device program there, medical device program. We'd like to know more about the room that, the, that we walked in. We click on info. We can leave the room just as easily with the leave command and disconnect from the network with disconnect. All right, so that's kind of the rundown of uh, the web application, which is under development. If we look at status, it says that clearly, application under development, okay? Anybody who wants to help, um, who wants to help develop this, let me see how to, All right, so what we can, so there is a URL to show. I have written it down some other place, but I'll never be able to find it. So I'll just reuse this piece of paper. Everything going okay, AJ? So, if you'd like to help to develop all of this uh, web application logic, which is quite challenging, it's just tedious, lots of troubleshooting, fire bug and debugging, uh, you can do a, a fork of the repository because it's all open source. The repository is found here. So this one is certainly calm. I know that because we don't have org. <laughs> and we have a certificate. Everything's okay here. SCM stands for Source Code Management. And um, if you do go there, then you can find all of our source code. Shall we take a look? Or are there questions about something else, some other topic? General text, office text. We don't see questions. So what we'll do, we'll take a look at the source code management system. How do I get back to that? Here it is. Okay, so now we will choose instead of BOB. Let's go to SCM, shall we? And the nice thing about SCM is that it takes quite a long, long time to load because it's a very slow virtual uh, virtual server, VPS, virtual private server. All right, but in any case, we see that there's that something did come up here. So instead of uh, explaining all of these things and clicking through each one, which is a very slow process, I will just go right to Aparatos, which is, mon, which is 
Esperanto for devices. And then we have a list of the different types of devices. Badges is here. And in the list of badges, we should see a few different things. And there is Monero Rising, Iron Triangle, which is the which is a parent project of this derivative, the Bush of Being. And I think I should re rename this, but the Bush of Being is the this is the inner village badge. So I just clicked on that. Let's navigate over to where the, the web application is found. It's under software. So there's a bit of things to read about here. The storyline, hardware, network. It's not up to date, but I think it's good enough explaining a few things. So right here in software, that's because it's obviously not hardware or graphics and closure or documents. So if we have a web application, it's going to be listed under software. So I click there. We've got the website. So we may see other things here under software. We may have, um, you know, Android, APK, uh, not the APK itself, but the source code that um, builds the APK and whatever it's called for the Apple. So I'm going to click on website, and then most people who have, are familiar with websites, you see the traditional CSS, you know, the HTML5 and JavaScript CSS um, arrangement. So we've got documents. This is where um, Andres's um, uh, user manuals are located inside. The, the actual sources. And then we've got a few things. I think Font Awesome is in here as well, a few things like that. So here's the index. I don't think anything else is, is all that interesting. I'll just click on index to see what that looks like. And we're not gonna drill down too deep, but this very last level is just kind of maybe interesting for some reason. This is all the source code. Oh my, and it's just not interesting at all. <laughs> okay, so we do have some snippets and you can navigate through this SCM source code management on your own because it is a public site. You can fork, pull, and um, fetch sources. You can do merge requests and And I certainly hope that you do as well, because we could use the help. I mean, there's few of us doing work on this, so that's why we're kind of behind on things like the web application. So AJ says that all is good. I'm happy about that. Um, we have another 20 minutes or so. What should I do now? So yesterday, what I said I would demonstrate was um, the Impersonation is going to be a bit difficult, but I said I would demonstrate um, a passive capture. It's not data theft because these are my own devices. So it's like opening the drawers to your shirt drawer. You know, you're not stealing your shirts when you do that in your own house, right? So that's why I can take my own data and everything is just fine. If you do this without your own data, it's just not okay at all. So what I have here is a very nice box of chocolates. I wish the light was a bit better. I'm gonna try to adjust the lights a bit. I'm not sure if that helps. <laughs> I don't know if that helps. So I've got a nice box of chocolate here. And the first thing what I will do is prepare this because I forgot to turn something on. All right, and that's the other camera angle. That's about the size of the box of chocolates. And that's, <laughs> that's the way a box of chocolates sounds, isn't it? I don't know if you heard that. So if I remove this cover, open this up, what do you think is inside? You wanna take a guess? No, you don't wanna guess? I'll show you. Okay, so that's these chocolates are inside. You know, you know they're definitely chocolates. All right. 
Okay, so um, I've almost I've eaten almost all of them. I'm sorry, I didn't leave any for you. So what do you think will happen once we put this lid on on the uh, on the chocolate again? And let me just do that. I should have prepared this beforehand. Sorry about that. All right, so we've got the box of chocolates. I am now going to place, let me just do this a different way. I'm going to place a library card on the box of chocolates. The contrast is very bad because it's blue library card and blue chocolates. I'm so, sorry about that. I couldn't change the colors quickly. All right, so here's a library card. And I'm just going to drop that on there. Not sure if you heard that. If you didn't, I will put my microphone next to that box of chocolates. So I think you heard it that time. What I just did is capture data off of my library card. All right, so here I'm looking at the data now because if this wasn't my own data and if it was a credit card instead of a library card or say a passport, I'm not sure what types of cards and devices have this kind of circuit inside, but this one as we can see is a MyFair. So it's a ISO 14443, this is the RFID standard. And we just captured the, the data, right? It's The good news is that it's encrypted. You can tell that because it's got an ATQA and an SAK. But the serial number is there and you can certainly see some things, right? So what is this number, ISO 14443? Let's just do one more thing. Um, how shall I do this? I'm going to capture the data off of my InterVillage badge now. And I will demonstrate that it's very difficult to trick your InterVillage badge in the same manner for one reason, because it has passive data theft protection built in. All right, so this is the screen. You can see that it's empty. I'm now going to try to capture the data in the same way and just dropping it on there. It does nothing. It's impossible to capture the data. All right, I'm going to align the antenna. There is no problem. The device is perfectly well aligned on top of the turned on smartphone, which is capturing right now. It's reading. The reason that it does not successfully um, capture the, uh, the data passively in this manner would be uh, known as theft is that I have not pushed on one of the three buttons. And once I do that, as long as the screen is still turned on, once I do that, we should hear it capture. So let me go back here. All right, so I think you heard that. It did capture something as I was pushing down on there. Let's see what it captured. So it got all the data off of my InterVillage badge, that thing. Um, and the good news about that, so it's a different ISO standard. If we want to use the the ISO 14443 like the library card was, and I just need to use a different um, button, right? Because we have 15693 on these two. And the sun is a 14443 standard, which is my fair. So we can basically copy the data off of this library card onto this badge, all right? It is encrypted, which makes it more difficult, but some, some library cards are not encrypted. So um, some of the, the things to understand about that, it did successfully copy the data or capture it, right? If this is a box of chocolates that's unopened, you would not know that this is happening. And you can do this with a number of daily objects like magazines, um, newspapers. You can embed a reader into a table itself at a coffee shop. I think you understand the point. So today and tomorrow, yesterday and forever, there are um, there are people stealing data and we wouldn't know it. And that's what makes it important 
to have a sense of, not a sense, to have a technical circuit built in which disconnects the antenna when you're not pushing on this. When a human is not pushing on one of the three buttons, this antenna is not connected to the to the ICs, the integrated circuits, which are storing the data. And what that means is that it's nearly impossible. It could possibly, it might not be impossible. I just don't want to say that, but it's very difficult. It's very, very difficult to uh, capture data off of these things unless you're pushing on a button. And what I call that is defense of passive data theft. Is that what you call it too, need money? Are you watching? All right, so um, we just d demonstrated um, the passive data theft protection. And we demonstrated the writing of information. We demonstrated the passive capture of a library card. We demonstrated um, the difficulty of copying encrypted information. And we saw a nice chocolate box <laughs> demonstration. And what else do we have? So there are a variety. What I like to experiment with are these types of um, transit cards. Are quite often they either have a uh, copper smart card um, integrated circuit, or they have an antenna inside. You can't see it then. And here's one, for example, with with an antenna inside. How about this? Let's do another test. I will turn on this smartphone again. So we'll get this working again, and we've got this turned on. Remember, it's always very important to have your screen turned on. Otherwise, the NFC circuit, a lot of the radios don't work. All right, so this is an empty screen. There is no data on the screen. We're now going to passive, passively copy data off of a transit card. Shall we do that? All right, so I'll just drop it on there. And if you heard that, it's already, it's too late. If I was not the owner, then I would have just lost the information. So what we have here, this is an interesting memory model. It's a MyFair again. So you would see the 14443. It has a serial number. It has um, memory information. So this is quite interesting. On the Pro model, it dumps the, the memory. On this one, it doesn't. But in any case, so we just captured the data from a transit card. All right, so that's how that works. What else can we demonstrate? We can take a quick look at, at what the, the devices look like from start to finish during the manufacturing. So the manufacturing starts with a etched circuit board like this. Get the light a bit better. Yeah, the light's not... Yeah, the lighting is just not very good. But, so I'm not happy about that. And then there's a shadow if I do that. Okay, so this is the uh, PCB or printed circuit board. And if you take a quick look, there are no parts on there. You can see the three different footprints, U1, U2, U3. There's no switches on the switch, SW1, SW2, SW3. So that's how we start. The other side needs to be flush and straight, so we don't have parts on there at all because it needs to be right up against the reader device in some situations. So we end, we begin by populating parts on this side. So I'm going to show a different PCB now. There they are side by side, and the one doesn't have parts, and this one does. Okay, so what does that look like? After we populate the PCB with switches, with EEPROMs, with integrated circuits, that's what it looks like then. There we go, focused. So we've got the three switches on there. We've got a piece of Kapton tape on top to keep them in place. 
and then we've got our EPROMs, two of which are holding data in NDEF type four, I'm sorry, NDEF type five, and the last one, which is this one, U3, is holding data in uh, the format of NDEF type four. That's the MyFair one. All right, now the other side is just the same because like I said before, in some cases we need this antenna to be right up against the um, reading device. And for this reason, we can't put parts there. And the next step in the procedure to populate or to create these devices and assemble them is to place an overlay on the front and a piece of leather on the back for protection. All right, so what does that look like? The overlays look like this. So that's what it's like when, I'll just use one here. So that's what it looks like when we have place the overlay, which is has an adhesive uh, back on it, peel the adhesive back on and put the overlays on. And you can see that through the overlay, there are windows, transparent windows that show you the parts underneath the small chips. The other side of the badge, because we're going to be, so this is hard to see because it's black, but in this case, it's red. This is where we differentiate the colors in the villages. Monero obviously has an orange one. And the reason that leather is on there, so that when you put this against the phone, that it's not scratching your lens. Okay, so there is a functional purpose for this leather. Most people think that it's decorational. <laughs> I mean, it does feel good, but it's actually there to protect your le the lens of your reading device, which is usually a smartphone. All right, so that's the front and the back. And once we do that, all we need to do to finish the device is to put it inside a enclosure frame. The reason this has two stripes is that they come out of the printer like this. It needs supports in between those two protruding um, pieces of the model. And that's why we put some supports in between. And one problem that we found is that every 10th uh, badge that we assemble, we break this, the, the um, the frame on it. So that's one reason we're not enclosing frames with the do-it-yourself models, because it would just be too much of a, we would need to supply two, three, four frames for each badge to make sure to ensure that the person didn't break it. All right, so that frame goes on the edge of the badge, as you can imagine, and it covers part of the, the leather to keep that on, and the edge is no longer, well, let me, I mean, this doesn't look good when you don't have when you don't have that plastic on. You can see the the different layers. So that's kind of a decorational thing. I do suppose that if you drop the badge, that the plastic frame does help a bit there as well. So you could call it a protectional feature. All right. So that's. Um, I just realized that I forgot to record this. I'm supposed to record. <laughs> okay, now it's too late. We're five minutes or ten minutes away from the end. Okay, I forgot, sorry. Um, right, so this is what happens when you fully create the badge. And we have some black ones, which are called, the model number is called Black Matter, Black Matter, Monero Orange. We've got some, at, some Attack Red, red on the back and on the front. We've got Defense Blue. The Defense Blue is quite nice, it's very translucent. You can see right through the plastic in some, in some areas. This is what's so nice about SLA stereolithography. It's much more difficult to get a FDM or fused deposition modeling uh, process translucent. Anyway, so these are all the colors. I think there's a green one as well. And then we have some uh, unique village colors. Let me show a couple of those. Like this one belongs to the rogues village. Colors do not, I don't know if maybe I can, I think it's a lighting problem. In any case, this is blue. You can't tell that it's blue. With a white frame. And they chose this because these are the colors of the rogues village. They chose the symbols as well. We got a lot of help from the rogues village. Really appreciate that. Thanks folks at the Rogues Village. This is the biohacking 
color scheme that they chose and reserved for their village because in biohacking they have black and green and so as you can imagine the front is the same on all of these translucent green frame you can really see through that can't you and the back is black so i don't need to go through all of these because there are five or six different ones but that's kind of how they look and so with 10 with five minutes left i would just invite questions and if there are no questions then we can either we can either finish early or i can maybe look for some more Oh, I know what I forgot. I, I wrote this in the description for this for this um, presentation. And what I forgot is to show other badge types. So here is a prototype. This is kind of how we were developing um, before we got far enough to release the design. So we have some some wires soldered on there, and extra button up here, which is a different which is a different tactile strength. Here, these are 260 grams, and this one up here is only two uh, is only 130, I think. And different parts. These are M24 SR LR04, and the back looks very similar. So this is a prototype board. Here is the Monero Rising. This is quite nice. I, I soldered a header on there for the um, SAO connection. And basically, how these work, it comes with a battery. You turn it off. Uh, you turn it on and off on the side here. When you turn it on, it lights up, obviously, because there are a lot of LEDs on here. So let's see what that looks like on the front. Now we'll turn it on. All right. So that flash is a. Um, it's kind of a negotiation. It says I've turned on. It's indicating that the badge is ready for action. So there are three uh, capacitive touch buttons on the bottom here. They're not tactile, they're capacitive touch, which means I just lightly put my, put my finger on the middle one to turn it on and off. So now it's on. I have to be careful when I'm using the buttons because they are very sensitive. So pressing them from the back is possible as well. Let's see if I can do that. Okay, it's not so easy as easy as I thought, but if I push the same button again, it turns it off. You understand how that works? Once turns it on, once turns it off. So that's the on off button. The buttons to the side, left and right, these change the animation. Some of you already know this because we've produced quite a lot of these badges and a lot of people um, took them home last year. So I will move to the second animation. Here's a third animation. So I can go back to the first. And in all cases, when I switch the animation, I have to rest my finger on there long enough for it to complete the entire animation cycle. If I just do a quick tap, it will not read. Okay, well, then it did, but you get the idea. Unless I'm touching that button at the very end, it won't, um, it won't register. All right, so that's how the animations work. You can switch, you can turn this on and off with the middle, turn it back on. Turn it off, turn it on. So that's how these things work. The one that I like the most, it's the very first one. It's, I think it's Starry Night or Sparkle. I can't remember the name. These, these animations have names. Yeah. Um, I wish Midi Poet was here because he did the firmware design and engineering. He called these things what, what they look like, like this Starry Night. And we're close to finished with the badge clinic for today, but I hope that some of this information was helpful. Once again, I will turn it over just to show the back in case you're curious. That's how it looks. I could put this under the microscope, but anything larger than this very small uh, part on the end under the microscope, it's, it doesn't, you can't tell, it doesn't help because the microscope is too powerful. So this is what this badge looks like. It has, I think, 100, uh, between 120 and 140 parts. I've forgotten the actual number. You turn it on and off with a switch on the, on the right here. Be careful with this switch. You don't want to push down while you're, it's, it's good to be careful with it. It has 
it has bent off in some situations and you have to bend it back. So I'll just turn it off there. And that's the hardware on off switch. All right, so we're five minutes until the next presentation, I, which I believe is, let's just check that out. Unless AJ wants me to stop or I don't know if we have a next presenter. Let's just check this out. Monero village dot what org com. I really I don't know. I'm going to do org. OK, so this is not TLS protected, but in this in this moment, I'm not so concerned. So let's see who's doing the next presentation. We have Badge Clinic is what's happening right now. And so in one half hour, we're going to hear from Ruben. Giving competition to Monero by ditching opt-in privacy. All right, so this looks very interesting. This appeals to me quite a lot. It's always nice to know what other cryptocurrencies are um, doing and how that relates and contrasts with our technology here at the Monero Village. And we actively uh, welcome all of the cryptocurrencies in the world, including the one you just made five minutes ago with your Python module, uh, <laughs> right, your Python library. Um, so this is what we do in Monero Village, right? Anything that's blockchain related, cryptocurrency, things like that, you're welcome to um, ask questions about it or just come by and explain your project. We had that with Loki Mesh as well today. Really interesting stuff. And in the next um, presentation, which is coming in just one half hour, um, it will be from a Zcoin enthusiast and developer, I believe. So that sounds, that looks really good. So I'm going to say goodbye. And I hope that you liked all of these devices. These, dev these badges, they're, I think are sold out for the for the do-it-yourself models um, because people seem to like those quite a lot. But I do have this stack right here plus a few others of the pre-assembled model. Uh, so if you're interested in a def in a attack red, a defense blue, um, you can get that. And I'll write the URL here as well just in case you're not sure where to find them. And with that, then we will turn off the stream. So the URL is shop.monerodevices.com. That's where you can still available get your badge. Does that sound good, Need Money? Are you uh, watching now? Are you watching, um, Scott? Who's watching besides myself? All right, so that's... That's all for today. This was the badge clinic, the last badge clinic of the year 2020. Well, you know, we could could be in China for, uh, I'm not sure about that. They canceled China, but that was the badge clinic for DC28. And um, thanks a lot to the AV folks for helping AJS. You did a great job and, and Justin as well. Okay, so I will say goodbye. And that's it for me. My name is Michael. I'm MSVB. Have a good one and thanks for listening.